Hi, my name is Randall Stafford, and I want to welcome you to this first day of our evidence-based traditional Asian medicine conference. I'm really happy to have so many people online viewing us remotely. Welcome. My goal is to talk about anti-inflammatory diets to prevent metabolic and cardiac disease. In giving this talk, I'm hoping to give you a flavor for not only the recommendations coming out of Western nutrition science, but also to delve into some of the underpinnings. What are some of the assumptions? What are some of the biases that are built in to Western nutrition science? Before I get started, I wanted to give you a little more background on myself. So my training is both in public health as well as primary care internal medicine. My research focus over the last 30 years has been on prevention and chronic disease, including such topics as health behaviors, obesity and diabetes, chemo prevention with medications and supplements, physician prevention practices, re-engineering primary care for better prevention, and health disparities by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomics. My interest in traditional Asian medicine stems both from my academic work in China, as well as my personal interests in yoga and Buddhism. Here's what I'm gonna talk about today. First, I'm gonna start by giving a review of prevention health and what it is that prevention health science is trying to do and make the point that this is around using information from populations to give advice. Although this prevention health model shares some familiar concepts with treatment-oriented Western health care, I wanna make the point that it differs in some as well. And also that nutrition is only one of several prevention strategies. I wanna delve into some of the underlying premises that underpin Western nutrition science, including how we think about the foods we eat. How do we think about dietary composition, particularly macronutrients and micronutrients? In terms of how we judge diets, the emphasis in Western medicine is to gauge the impact of a diet on measurable disease outcomes. And a key focus is on mechanisms of aging, inflammation, and energy balance. I then wanna focus on what are the key recommendations coming out of nutrition science? And some of these are fairly straightforward, but I think deserve some emphasis. Obviously maintaining a healthy weight with low visceral adiposity is one of the most important parts of nutrition advice. Also reducing foods with adverse effects such as trans fats and high glycemic index carbohydrates, and also increasing those foods with known beneficial effects, such as dietary fiber and eating foods that are nutrient dense. I define prevention very broadly, and whether for clinicians or for members of the population, prevention is any action that's not aimed at the signs or symptoms of a disease, but is really meant to forestall or prevent things from happening in the future. Prevention health is a population health science that's evidence-based, and it uses an assessment at a population level to motivate action. And this action could come through clinicians or health policy. For instance, I may wanna know what should I tell my patients about what they should eat, or a nutritionist, wants to know what sort of advice she should give to patients. It also can, can be translated into policies. Are there certain foods where we should expand their availability or certain foods where we should limit availability? The general underlying concept in Western nutrition science is that there's one best diet, although we do recognize some issues with individuals and differences between individuals. And again, I wanna emphasize that nutrition would never be discussed alone, but really is one of several different prevention strategies. While there are commonalities between 
a prevention model and a treatment-oriented Western healthcare model, there are also differences. This chart illustrates some of the differences between what I call sick care or our typical treatment-oriented medical care and true health care, which is prevention-oriented. Sick care really focuses only on individuals. And it is based on the premise that we can discern the best recommendations by breaking things down to the smallest level. The emphasis is on disease-specific problems and outcomes, with health defined as the absence of disease. This system works best with very specialized knowledge and emphasizes new sophisticated technology. And in some ways, this type of healthcare works best for acute issues where simple technological solutions work. And these may be quite sophisticated technologies, but for instance, the idea of doing a stent is a relatively simple technical solution. Payment for services in a sick care system is basically for fixing problems and using technology. And in fact, it contains an implicit incentive not to prevent disease, in part because that's bad for business. I want to contrast sick care with prevention-oriented health care. In this model, we have strategies that can be aimed at individuals, groups, and society at large. The idea is that we need to understand many health problems at a systems level and recognize that there are synergies between issues. This is a whole person approach, and the emphasis is on prevention and promotion of health as a positive quality that is not just the absence of disease. Information is more general and recognizing, recognizes the importance of the lived experience of individuals. Rather than only focusing on sophisticated technologies, this model seeks to deploy all known strategies and in some sense is relatively agnostic as to where those strategies come from. Chronic problems requiring behavior change and complex solutions are really the sort of things that this model is best at. And ideally payment within a prevention oriented healthcare system would be for maximizing wellness and promoting health. Some of the underlying premises of a prevention model for nutrition include how we think about dietary composition and how we want to be able to measure certain macronutrients and micronutrients in the food we eat. The target here is to obtain a quantifiable reduction in disease outcomes. That is, the best, pop, the best diet for a population is the one that minimizes the occurrence of disease outcomes. There's also a key focus on biological mechanisms and disease pathways. Some of the biological concepts may have to do with aging, inflammation, energy balance, and intermediate risk factors. And the whole time, it's important to recognize the emphasis on measurability. Another concept that's important here is risk stratification. And this means taking more aggressive measures with individuals who are at higher risk of bad outcomes. Like a treatment-oriented healthcare model, a prevention model still has this flavor of empiricism. That is the idea that the whole can be best understood by its constituent parts. So how do we think about, how do we talk about what we eat? Within a prevention model, we're talking about measurable components, including macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients include things like fats and oils, carbohydrates, proteins, and water. On the other hand, getting down to the very um, molecular level, we need to think about micronutrients, including vitamins and minerals that may be contained within various foods. And all the while, there's also an emphasis on the caloric content or energy content of the food we eat and the density of that, uh, those calories within foods. 
I want to talk a little bit about the biological mechanisms that are that underlie a nutrition science approach. Um, in general, as I said before, there's this emphasis on clinical adverse outcomes or endpoints. These can be things like whether you live or die, hospitalization, events like heart attacks, or the diagnosis of diabetes or the occurrence of cancer. Implicitly, this emphasis on adverse outcomes de-emphasizes any attention to things like quality of life or positive outcomes. One of the leading biological mechanisms that's coming into common uh, knowledge is inflammation. And by this, we mean systemic chronic activation of our immune system. Now, there are multi multiple dimensions of inflammation, and we don't fully understand how these different dimensions interact. And yet inflammation does seem to be at play within many chronic diseases. Similarly, aging has to do with cells and their function and their ability to continue to reproduce over time. And the idea that at one point cells give out, this can be measured by something called telomere length, which is a bit of DNA at the ends of chromosomes. Energy balance is another important concept. And by this, we, we simply mean that if my intake of calories is greater than my expenditure of calories or output, I'm going to gain weight. Disease risk factors are a very important concept in nutrition science. These are often predictive intermediate outcomes that usually don't have much meaning to individuals, but they are strong predictors of future adverse outcomes. And these include things like blood pressure, lipids, insulin resistance, body mass index, smoking and alcohol. Inflammation seems to be a common mechanism that lies beneath many of these risk factors. This is a, a relatively complicated diagram, but a couple of things I want to emphasize here. First of all, the major causes that we think about are health behaviors, the environment we live in, and our genetic predispositions. These interact through a series of biological mechanisms to cause changes in risk factors for disease. And these risk factors in turn go on to cause these disease outcomes whether it's something like heart disease or other arterial disease, cancer, kidney disease, cognitive decline, depression, and even infertility. I wanna make the point that there are some alternative pathways, but generally it's this idea of health behaviors, environment, and genetics working through biological mechanisms to, to change risk factors, which then change long-term outcomes. Let me get into some of the recommendations coming out of nutrition science. Um, some of this may seem obvious, but I wanna go over it in some detail. So general recommendation is for a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. A diet should have reduced saturated and hopefully no trans fats. Um, there's a recommendation to avoid sugar sweetened beverages. A diet should be plant predominant with most food coming from plant sources. And a plant-based diet is often high in dietary fiber. Uh, there's a particular uh, recommendation to reduce the intake of processed and packaged foods. And these dietary recommendations can take many concrete forms. And I've listed here three possible uh, diets that adhere to the general recommendations. These include a dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet or a DASH diet, a Mediterranean diet, which is a low fat dairy diet and an ovo-lacto vegetarian diet. Let me get into some of the specific components of a healthy diet. So when we talk about fruits, vegetables and whole grains, we're talking about foods where they have macronutrients that include lower glycemic index carbohydrates, limited saturated fats, 
no trans fats, and a high dietary fiber content. Now, there is relatively low protein in these sources, but adequate for human needs. And often in our culture, we emphasize protein intake to an excessive degree. The micronutrients contained in fruits, vegetables, and whole grain include antioxidants and potassium as an important mineral. I want you to keep in mind that there's also a substitution effect. If we eat more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, then by the very nature of our eating patterns, we're less likely to eat other foods with unfavorable profiles. A major recommendation is to reduce the intake of high glycemic index carbohydrates. And let me go over a little bit what a glycemic index means. This is the extent to which a, a carbohydrate is rapidly converted to blood glucose in our body. And as you can see in the chart, some foods get into our body very quickly, others take a little bit longer, and some take even longer to be digested. High glycemic index carbohydrates like sugar, white rice, white bread, and cornflakes get into our body very quickly and are converted rapidly from simple starches and sugar into blood sugar. In contrast, medium glycemic index foods like wheat bread and brown rice are harder for our bodies to digest. And it takes the carbohydrates in these foods longer to get into our bloodstream. And at the other extreme, we have broccoli and cauliflower, um, which are in a very low range of glycemic index. The, that they have plenty of carbohydrate, but that carbohydrate, as in the green line here, takes a great deal of time to fully be digested. And some of the issue is that the types of fibrous vegetables like these are just much more difficult to readily digest. And of course, the easiest thing to digest is sugar that's put in beverages. And there's a specific recommendation to really cut down or avoid entirely sugar sweetened beverages. And there's some very important research that shows that high glycemic index carbohydrates have an inflammatory impact on our system. That is these types of foods generally lead to activation of our immune system. I'm gonna talk a little bit about fats, particularly reduce the recommendation to reduce saturated fats and eliminate trans fats. And what's the difference between these? Well, as I illustrate here on the right, saturated fats have no double bonds. They're pretty much a straight chain of carbon atoms fully occupied by hydrogen. These are generally from animal sources and are solid at room temperature. On the other hand, unsaturated fats have double bonds causing the type of bend that's illustrated here. These are generally from plant sources and are liquid at room temperature. Trans fats are a completely different issue. These are unsaturated fats that are forced to uh, pick up additional hydrogen atoms, making them solid at room temperature. The type of double bond that's formed in, in, in trans fats is a type that's not found in nature, and trans fats tend to be very inflammatory. I should also mention omega-3 fatty acids. These are a type of fatty acids that's particularly beneficial and that often come from marine um, animal sources of food. In terms of dietary potassium, this is a relatively new recommendation. And it's one that I think fits very well with this emphasis on fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Uh, Americans don't, in, don't have a high enough intake of potassium, whereas the recommendation is three and a half to five grams per day. The average American intake is about 2.2 
grams per day. Um, the recommendation is to get this potassium through foods that are naturally high in potassium. Um, and you can see here that there's plenty of potassium. It's not difficult to reach three and a half grams per day, given that things like a sweet potato or a half cup of white beans actually contain a good deal of potassium. Well, the potassium itself may not be anti-inflammatory. These foods have enough other components that the net result of eating a high potassium diet is to have an anti-inflammatory impact. And of course, many of you know about the recommendation to reduce the intake of dietary sodium. And here too, Americans are really off the recommendation. They eat way too much sodium compared to the recommendation. Um, and I need to point out that in Asia, this problem is even more substantial with intakes of sodium in excess of 8,000 milligrams or eight grams per day in many countries. Um, you can see how easy it is to get up to a large amount of sodium, given that six ounces of pretzels contains three quarters of a gram of sodium. Because populations tend to be so far off from the recommendations, there's been a modified recommendation, which basically is recommending that people reduce their amount of intake of sodium by 1,000 milligrams per day. So for instance, if I were eating 6,000 milligrams per day, the goal would be for me to, at first, reduce that to 5,000. In general, the recommendation is to have no added salt at the table and to try to reduce the use of salt in cooking. Uh, but in some ways, most of the salt that people eat is from prepared foods. And the very nature of prepared foods is that things like breads, crackers, cheese, snacks, and sauces often are very high in sodium. I have some bad news about alcohol. So alcohol not only increases blood pressure, but it has an a inflammatory impact. And unfortunately, for many years, there has been a good deal of mythology surrounding alcohol's benefits with the idea that if we drink a, a glass of wine a day, that's good for us. That type of thinking has generally been um, is, has no evidence behind it. And careful population studies suggest that if there is some benefit for alcohol in certain diseases like heart disease, that benefit is offset by harms in other areas, for instance, in inflammation or in liver disease. Currently, the recommendation is for men to drink no more than two drinks per day and women no more than one drink per day. In the future, I anticipate that we will be moving towards an even stricter standard where both men and women are recommended to have no more than five drinks per week. And a drink is defined in the, the standard way as 14 grams of pure alcohol. And again, despite the mythology about possible benefits of alcohol, alcohol does contribute to an inflammatory state within the body. Weight stability and dealing with weight gain are a major problem. The ideal healthy body weight measured by the body mass index, which essentially is a measure of weight adjusted for height, is for East and South Asians, an ideal body mass index is between 19 and 23. For people of other ancestry, BMI up to 25 is a healthy weight. Now, in this country, as in other countries all around the globe, these goals are um, not met by a substantial fraction of the population. So we really have a problem with the health of our population in terms of its weight. The good news, however, is that there are substantial benefits of losing 5% of body weight. So in other words, 
it's not necessary to have massive weight loss to have health benefits. I wanna emphasize the importance of central adiposity. That's fat that is located within the abdominal cavity as opposed to peripheral fat located underneath the skin or in the breasts or the buttocks. Abdominal fat is much more deleterious to the uh, metabolic process. And the good news also is that weight loss, even relatively uh, minimal weight loss can be anti-inflammatory. I want to move from talking about diet to at least mentioning some key other health behaviors. Physical activity is an incredibly important health behavior. And this is true whether it's aerobic physical activity, that is large muscle groups with increased heart rate, or it's strength training or isometric training. And this is a relatively new finding. We talk a lot about aerobic physical activity. But the fact is that these other forms of, of activity are also very beneficial and anti-inflammatory in their impact. Finally, I wanna mention sleep, stress, and social networks. These are other behaviors that sometimes don't get enough attention. Sleep quality and quantity are anti-inflammatory. Sleep more, your body is less likely to develop a chronic inflammation. Um, this means seven hours of relatively un uninterrupted sleep. Chronic stress is also a major factor, and particularly as societies modernize and have this electronic digital age that's upon us, physiologic and psychological stress is rampant. And the role of stress also ties into the benefit that we see from mindfulness activities and stress reduction strategies. And then finally, strong social networks are incredibly important. They provide a buffer, they are a source of resilience, and for many people, a source of meaning in their lives. So coming back to where I started, I wanna just mention again, some of the underlying concepts that may create bias as we think about Western nutrition science relative to traditional Asian medicine. I do wanna make the point that many of these underlying concepts are actually strengths and that we need to think very hard about how it is that we can capture some of those strengths, but maybe allow a little more latitude in other ways. So Western nutrition science still conceives of nutrition as a sum of the parts thinking. That is, things are best understood if we get them down to the molecular level. And this really excludes thinking more holistically about synergies between foods or synergies within a given food. Um, this model emphasizes just one best solution for dietary advice. And this may be good advice for populations, but generally it doesn't pay much attention to the need to tailor advice to different individuals. This model is based on measurable risk factors. Um, there are some ways in which this need to measure things dictates a lot about what we look at in Western nutrition science. Also biological mechanisms. These are important mechanisms, but in some ways, biological mechanisms are best solved by other chemicals like drugs. And this way of thinking really excludes other types of causal models, whether it be a, a psychological model or something that considers the mind-body connection. And then finally, this emphasis on measurable negative outcomes really emphasizes a set of consequences at the expense of thinking about what matters to people and the positive potential outcomes that might come about in health. That is this idea of health being more than the absence of disease. In fact, health may be something that we consider we're doing well if we are thriving. 
So in conclusion, I've talked about Western dietary science and some of its underlying premises. These premises both are strengths as well as biases um, versus other health models that we're gonna be talking about today. This framework for understanding different systems, different health models, I think is really useful, particularly when we talk about understanding compatibilities between different health models and the potential for integrating different health models together. Again, the advice out of nutrition science is very straightforward. It talks about reducing deleterious intake, like high glycemic index carbohydrates and bad fats. It also talks about maintaining healthy weight. And then finally, emphasizing beneficial intake, those foods that are good for us, like fiber, nutrient-dense fruits and vegetables. I can't help emphasizing again that nutrition science goes hand in hand with thinking about other health behaviors, particularly things like physical activity, sleep, and stress. And in my mind, while there are some biases and some issues to be critical of in Western nutrition science, I consider the biggest problem with a Western dietary approach to be the widespread barriers to its adoption. We don't do very well at getting the population to follow the outcome of using the science of nutrition. And I hope that in some sense, we can gain something from traditional Asian medicine, which has a different set of premises. We can gain something in terms of how we get the population as a whole to eat in a more healthy way. Thanks for your attention. And I'm hoping we have a couple minutes for questions. Thanks again. Bye-bye.